It's showing error loading so far. I don't know. I'm watching it. We right are. Now. We are live. Okay. Welcome to this edition of the Slave Food Project. The Slave Food Project is the journey of two African American physicians as they examine the role of racism as a unique form of stress and the weaponization of food in the creation of health disparities in the African American communities, irrespective of income. They discover eating a whole food plant based diet in urban communities is possible and is the key to eliminating health disparities. Let me introduce you to the doctors. Dr. Columbus Batiste is a board certified cardiologist and chief of cardiology in Southern California. Dr. Batiste's mission is to share information so that each one can teach one about the benefits of plant-based nutrition, daily exercise, and stress reduction. The mission has led to the formation of a nonprofit organization called the Healthy Heart Nation, which provides education through lectures, newsletters, social and digital media. Dr. Eric Walsh was born in Hartford, Connecticut. He is a graduate of the University of Miami School of Medicine, Loma Linda University School of Public Health, where he received his master's and doctorate in public health. Dr. Walsh has embarked on his own plant-based journey and as a result has lost more than 70 pounds by adopting this lifestyle. Dr. Walsh has committed his life to speaking around the globe through his preaching and healing ministries. This week, the slave food team breaks down the stress equation. The doctors look at the singular and, ad and additive between life stressors discrimination, and nutrition in the development of disease. Today, we are joined by Dr. Kinjis Watson, who is a postdoctoral research fellow with the Health and Equity Research Laboratory in the Biology Department at San Francisco State University, and is a Program Evaluation Director of the National Institute of Health, funded San Francisco Build Program at San Francisco State and UC San Francisco. Kinjis also teaches courses on educational inequality, black studies, and critical race theory in the education department at Occidental College. His research explores dynamics of the biopsychosocial um, impact of racial microaggressions, which are everyday racisms, endured by students of color across K through 20 educational spaces. Kinjis earned his PhD in education with an emphasis in race and ethnic studies at UCLA. We invite you to grab something to drink, grab a nice seat, and, and stay tuned for so, the Slave Food Project. We also invite you to share or do a watch party on Facebook so that you can share what is um, being distributed today and, and, and to invite your friends and family to be a part of the conversation. Thank you. All right. Welcome. Welcome. Kenjis. How you doing, man? It's good to see you. It's good to chat with you again. Yeah, it's good to good to be here. Doing well. Thanks. All for right. Absolutely. So we're excited. I'll tell you, when I stumbled across your article and I reached out to you, I was astonished at how quickly and rapidly you kind of responded back. And you know, I was hopeful. And then the wife was saying, listen, are you, you know, let's let's kind of connect with them. And and when we spoke with you on the phone, there was so much synergy in the work that you've done and really what this project is about. Man, it's a pleasure to meet you. It's a pleasure to have you on our conversation today. No, I, I'm really appreciative of the work you all are doing and directly addressing some of the ways that our folks can get well. Um, and so happy to be in conversation with like-minded folks who are doing this good work on behalf of our people. So thank you. All for right. Uh, well, before we get started, I always like to kind of just get jump into a few things real quickly. And so I understand that you have um, you grew up in California. You have some similarities with with the likes of of of, of who who is this famous person? Kawhi Leonard, I think. <laughs> yeah, on I think the other the other L.A. team, not yeah, the yeah. not the L.A. team, the other L.A. team. 
I was disappointed about that, about his choice. Um, but he's, you know, he's from Reno Valley and um, support anybody else from 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 Mobile. Um, and as you know, uh, you're located where you're doing some of your work at the hospital where I was born. Um, so there's a lot of uh, ties here um, to uh, particularly for folks in the Inland Empire area for black people living out there. I think that it's interesting that you're doing this work and I'm from the area trying to do this work. I think it, it um, you know, there, that connection is is nice. And yeah, I, I, I feel for Kawhi. I feel like he, you know, he's doing the best he can. I'm not going to hold it against him, but I, I think he chose it. <laughs> no, don't, don't, don't at me Kawhi, but I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> my man, my man. I love it. I love it. I love it. Last little bit. And I have to get this in here is give me your top five. I want your top five for fruits and vegetables. Give me your top five. Top five fruits and vegetables. You know, uh, we have a we have a, a twelve month old right now, right? So I'll I'll give you what what she what she what her diet is around, and um, I think that primary food centers around sweet potatoes. I think that that's our that's one of our bases. Um, Ayan also enjoys broccoli. Um, as do I. Um, we we do some kale, um, and uh, her her desserts are apple, uh, usually some combination of applesauce, strawberries, blueberries. Um, uh, but we 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 try to mix in some some cauliflower as well with her with her food. So those are probably my my top five. My partner does a really great cauliflower based uh, jambalaya instead of the rice. Um, so I gotta you know give it up to to her for that innovation. Love it, love it, love it. Dr. Walsh, Eric is gonna, he'll probably chime in later on on some of the health beneficial effects of some of those foods you're already giving your young one. But let's jump into this. Eric, good to be back on with you again and ready to kind of get into really this issue of stress. So why don't we start off, kick us off and tell us what is stress? What is stress? What is stress? What is this thing called allostatic load? So when we started this project, uh, one of the things that we found was that from a, from a, uh, purely kind of pathophysiological, um, traditional Western medicine standpoint, you cannot really explain fully the difference in life expectancy between African Americans and everyone else in this country. Um, and so we we started to try and figure it out. And I, I don't know, it, it came to me a long time ago, probably because of some of the experiences I've had around race when I was younger. Um, and it was pretty obvious to me that we have a unique burden of stress. I started looking at people like Bruce McEwen and there's a few others who've done some great work around uh, stress. And what, what what they talk about, you know, we all learn about homeostasis in school, right? That's the body's desire to stay at a kind of a, a, at the same point so that you survive. But then we also learned that when the body has to adapt to a threat, to a challenge, it's something called allostasis. Now, that is, so we, we have developed what is called the fight or flight response in order to make allostasis happen. And there are grades of it. If you go up a flight of stairs, that's allostasis. Get your heart rate up and get you up the stairs. Um, but what happens if the stressor or 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 the um, the challenge is persistent? If it doesn't go away, then it goes from allostasis to allostatic load, and there's a burden of stress that you carry all the time. What this, what we're talking about tonight is what happens when you are regularly and chronically exposed to stress. And in the readings, in some of the articles, I was just doing some more reading today. One of the things that's um, really interesting is that it is, it is actually the chronic low grade stress that sometimes is the most dangerous. And that makes sense. Um, obviously, if you're getting hit by massive amounts of stress all the time, it's going to have one effect. But having that chronic low, chronic low grade stress is one of the most damaging things. And I honestly believe that stress, um, when we do our presentation, we talk a lot about stress. You can keep going, go on, um, Columbus. We define stress this way, but the stress equation is what we talk about a lot. Um, so here it, it describes stress as a condition or feeling experienced. Um, when a person feels that the resources that they have don't, uh, or the demand that they have exceeds the personal and social resources they're able to mobilize. We shrunk that down into something called a stress equation. And on the next slide, we kind of show what that is. And that equation is that stress equals demands minus resources. Um, and once you understand that, 
it started things started to make sense. I remember growing up, and if one of my friends were pulled over for having a you know, ounce, you know, a nickel bag, whatever uh, of whatever in their car, they got into major trouble with the criminal justice system. But some of our white friends would be pulled over with the exact same thing. Their family's attorneys would step in, they get a slap on the wrist, and never spend any time behind a bar, uh, behind bars. The resources matter. The demands matter, not drive stress. And when stress happens, it does some incredible things. It releases something called cortisol in this fight or flight response that naturally turns down the immune system, number one. And number two, cortisol is what helps regulate the inflammatory response in the body. If you're always hyper-stressed, always of high cortisol levels, you develop tolerance to cortisol and you will stay inflamed. This, I believe, helps explain why we suffer from diseases, and especially right now, the coronavirus, because the coronavirus is a pro-inflammatory disease. Um, so we have a lot of slides on a lot of this stuff. Um, go to the next one. This is one of the ones that's really important. This is, um, I believe, initially one of the ones from um, McEwen, Bruce McEwen. And you can see here, it's these repeated hits of stress that are circled that I believe African-Americans get. And eventually, you actually don't respond. You'll get to this phase down in the bottom right corner, which is also very dangerous. Yeah, no, absolutely. Kent, just anything to add to that at all regarding stress and what it is and breaking it down for, for the listeners out there? Yeah, I appreciate Mc, the, the engagement with allostatic load and McEwen and Siemens' work. Um, I think that if anything to add is what Arlene Geronimus had mentioned around the weathering hypothesis. This, I think it's like back in the 90s as well, where the, the particular application, I think, of some of the learnings around allostatic load were given to, to our community, to black people, and that we experience a chronic uh, form of stress just by existing in a society that's really predicated on our undoing, that a society that is anti-black. Um, so I would argue that what it means to be a black person in a country founded uh, by and for and with the ideas of putting forward slavery. So as descendants of captives here, we have been exposed to chronic stress. Yes, it's sort of low level every day, um, repeated exposures to um, environmental conditions that overwhelm our ability to respond and maintain balance. And also I would argue historical trauma or epigenetic stress. So that's what we have inherited through the experiences of our ancestors who gave us our cells, right? So those cells have been conditionally or um, uh, continuously, I should say, um, repeatedly ex experiencing and, and exposed to extreme forms of stress, not just not just the mundane everydayness. And those extreme forms of stress are passed on and carried in information through cellular memory into our DNA that also tends to accumulate over time. And so our experiences with the chronic everyday lived experiences is echoing and in response to this longer history of black people that we have to sort of contend with. Wow, wow, wow. So, so let me let me backtrack because you both broke down some really important information here. And I want to just focus for a second. What you it seems to me you're describing is really the process of epigenetics, of really this transformation of the DNA. And we speak to that a lot of times in terms of food and lifestyle and mindset. But but for let's take for a moment, and I don't know if you want to jump in, Eric or Kendris, if you want to go back in in terms of describe what this epigenetic is, this process. I mean, I break it down. I usually talk about it's almost like a dimmer switch in your home and that the ability to turn down or turn up the disease process and this transformation that occurs on the DNA, these that can be passed along generationally is really one of the aspects. And so you're saying that discrimination, you're saying that these stressors can potentially be passed along? Sure, you know, some of the work that I do is centered around telomeres, which I can share um, if, that, if that's helpful. Um, uh, let me see here. Absolutely, that's, that's really, yeah. really profound stuff. So you should, yeah, throw that up. Okay. Uh, oh, looks like I'm, I'm having, I've got to pull up the actual application. Sorry, y'all. Here we go. Okay. Application. All right. Okay. So I'm just going to show what what telomeres are, so that um, folks can kind of get a sense of what what I do. Um, 
So I, I think of telomeres as a biomarker of anti-blackness. These are, telomeres are these protective caps at the ends of our chromosomes. And they're involved in protecting cells as our cells divide. Um, so what you saw there was that in each cellular division, these telomeres take on damage um, and eventually shorten. You can think about that. They lose, uh, they lose uh, parts of their components. Um, and so if you think about that, uh, a good analogy is sort of like the plastic tips at the ends of our shoestrings. So if you remember as a young person, you run around and those plastic tips at your shoestrings, which are called aglets, as those aglets, uh, you step on them or right, you stomp on them, eventually they, they begin to, to uh, come apart. And when those aglets are all gone, the shoestring kind of frays. Telomeres uh, function in the same way for our cells. If, if we think of our cell as the, as the, the shoestring and telomeres you know, as the, the sort of aglet. As the aglet uh, goes away, as the telomeres go away and the cells divide, eventually they, they go into senescence or they age out. Um, and that, that process is, is, is marked here, as you can see it. Um, uh, and we lost, we lost your slides real quickly in terms of like with the uh, telomere. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. I'm not, uh, I'm not. Oh, really? Okay. I can try to pull it up again. I don't know what happened. Can you see it now? That's okay. No. Let me huh. put that. Yeah. Give me a second. And if not, you can speak to it if you if you like. Right. You can speak to it, right? So essentially, they they. I think the main idea here is that as our cells divide, our telomeres take on damage, or our telomeres take on damage, and um, you can see it now during that process, right? And so as they go away, eventually as they go away, uh, our cells go into senescence, they age out. Now, let's say we get things like uh, we get gray hair and 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 wisdom, maybe some cool glasses, uh, some mindfulness of our bodies. We age, right? Or it's a way of marking age. Usually we mark age by how many times we, we, we go around the sun, right? How many times we've made a trip around the sun um, by our chronological uh, time on this planet. Um, and, and telomeres help us mark age at the biological level. So you can think about them as a, a sort of uh, a measure or a marker of aging. And, and I think they play a role in maybe epigenetics or chronic stress is back in 2009, uh, some researchers able uh, and some others won a, a Nobel Prize for showing a linkage between stress and telomere deterioration. So if telomeres tell us about how our bodies age on the inside, when you look at their study, what they saw is that mothers who had autistic children, their telomeres were aging, or they were, sorry, they were their telomeres were deteriorating faster than mothers who had children who were not autistic in the same time period. So you kind of think about it as an analogy is that they had aged in one year about two years at the cellular level relative to these moms whose children were not on the autism spectrum. And so we, when I think about black folks, it's looking at what that, that stress equation, I suppose, uh, that we see with those mothers of children who are on the spectrum, what they might be dealing with or encountering with just the daily stress of having children who are on that spectrum. Uh, we could compare that to the kind of daily stress that black people have and how that might be you know, implicated in telomere deterioration, which is another way of saying our premature aging. Because of course, black mm. people, we die earlier than other groups, as you all pointed out, um, regardless of our socioeconomic status. You know, these, these premature deaths, 38,000 premature deaths or 1.1 million years of life lost amongst our community. My mom's a flight attendant for Southwest and, um, you know, they're still flying people. And I think about it from that, that documentary, I think it's called A Natural Causes, where you think about the amount of black life that we lose each year is akin to a, a big, uh, passenger plane uh, full of black people falling out of the sky every day. And so I think about telomere uh, indicated in that, in that uh, it might tell us a little bit about where that's happening in our bodies as a way of marking or mapping where some of that stress, that stress um, impact is taking place. Hmm. Now that's, that's, Good that's, stuff. that's huge. I mean, because one of the things too, as well, and Eric, I'm gonna let you chime in is the fact Oftentimes we're faced, and even in med school, I remember oftentimes being told, listen, hey, African-Americans, Hispanics, they die sicker and sooner, right? They're at the bottom totem pole or at the, they're the highest leaders in terms of, of chronic disease. And you almost begin to accept it as fact alone, as if this is just who we are, as if it's genetic and that it's part of our, our makeup. And so 
this is this is fascinating in that it's not just part of our genetic makeup that we're born with. It's something that can evolve and degrade us over time is what I'm hearing. Yeah, I mean, just looking at maternal health, you all would know this as well, right? Within our communities, black mothers have some of the highest uh, rates of infant mortality. So our, our babies die more than other folks' babies, regardless of socioeconomic status. I think it's something like black women with the highest socioeconomic status still have a higher infant mortality rate than some of the poorest white women in our country. So you might say, okay, genetics, right? Bad genes or, or maybe even some of the things that you all talk about like food and, and, and whatnot, and that, that could be implicated. But when you look at black women from the diaspora, black women from the Caribbean or from, from the continent, from the home continent or from Brazil or elsewhere, when they come here, their infant mortality rates are better they have better infant mortality rates, uh, meaning lower than some of the wealthiest white women in our country. But within one generation, that's when you start to see it effect. So either there's something strange about our water, right? Something in the water, maybe as you all say, something in our food and how our food systems function. And I would also argue there's something unique about being a black person in a society that was built by slavery and for slavery um, and still hasn't reckoned with slavery. Um, that that also is implicated in our in our our well being and our life our lifelines. Yeah, that's powerful. Eric, you talk about that a lot in our talks too, as well. You you go into that too as well in terms of the role of being black in America and what it does to us. What do you have to add to to what yeah, you mentioned? Yeah, I think what he just said is, is definitely spot on. I mean, um, you know, when I first read one of those studies where they looked at women from Africa and compared them to white women in America, I was actually blown away. Um, and what it really tells you is that there's something something unique about America in its ability to make uh, black people sick. Um, and probably one of the ta best tangible ways to see that is maternal child health. But as we begin to really pull back and look at the science, we're starting to see that it's not just that. I mean, there are many other disease conditions, most of whom just don't have that kind of an immediate impact for you to be able to see it. So something honestly is happening, and the the telomere component is one of is one of the uh, um, one of the strongest um, components, possibly partly because it can be kind of be tested, and you can see the evidences of it. But I'll go back to um, inflammation. We as the st the research comes out, more and more of the information is saying, listen, chronic diseases come from inflammation, and so you know I, I talked earlier about like you know chronic everyday low grade stress, but it doesn't remove the fact that there's still giant huge stressors that happen like my uncle from america's georgia who you know who saw people lynched in growing up you know mm -hmm. i mean he, he traumatized them he you know so i mean there are big stressors that also happen so you have an intermittent you'll have the low chronic everyday stress then bam um you know something like what happened uh what happened with george floyd happens and collectively as a people you ask could that be my son could that be me? Mm -hmm. um, you, there, there's, there's a burden to that that no one else quite has to carry. Um, and that is what causes disease. Because again, once the cortisol levels are constantly elevated, your ability to regulate inflammation goes away. Once your ability to regulate inflammation goes to get away, you're in a chronic inflammatory state. Yeah. And, if, and here's what's deep. That affects not just your body. The research is all starting to say it affects your mind. And now your mind yeah. functions, leading to more things like depression and other things as well, which is pretty profound uh, when you start to step back and look at the, you know, um, kind of the, the status of mental health for our people, because you now are in a, you know, not only do you have the direct things causing you to have uh, trauma that will cause mental health issues, but the, but just the fact that it's always there. Yeah. physiologically actually also uh, begins to affect the brain. So uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done around what do we do to reverse the impact of this kind of stress. Um, obviously, removing the stress is, the, is probably the first and best thing. Um, but if yeah. you're going to be in it, how do you, what do we do to cope with it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I'm going to chime in real quickly because as a cardiologist, one of the things that we see with stress, the impact of stress, obviously the lack of sleep, the, the change and the shift in terms of your hormonal surge that interferes in terms of your metabolism, the left in the ghrelin, we know too as well in terms of its impact on insulin. But here's the key is that its impact on the endothelium, the lining of the vessels that then potentiates hypertension. We spoke about maternal death and the transfer from 
from the the West, the, uh, uh, the Caribbean into the, the States and from West Africa. But the same thing pretends itself with hypertension. Studies have shown as you move from Africa to the Caribbean to the United States that you see hypertension rates rise astronomically irrespective and and this lost thought of that it's solely this salt sensitivity gene right, right. it's the sole cause and that's been re refuted right and so we know that there's there's significant impact that it attacks the endothelium it poses an increase in heightened risk in terms of atherosclerosis or the hardening of the arteries that then leads to not only high blood pressure but stroke coronary artery disease heart failure kidney failure Alzheimer's disease, all of which that we're, we're leaders in in this, this regards. One other thing I want to kind of mention too as well, because I don't want this to get lost, and you mentioned this, and you mentioned these, the weathering, you mentioned these microaggressions, you mentioned in terms of referencing the everyday discriminatory uh, uh, scale that we all kind of appreciate, because many youth coming up before George Floyd were not able to relate to issues of lynching or things like that. It's these small micro level aggressions on a daily basis that really um, hit us. And so I want you folks to kind of touch on those a little bit, if you don't mind. Uh, Dr. Walsh, did you want to, or you want me to go ahead and talk? You first? start, you start. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen again. Hope this works. Um, uh, cause this is the sort of basis of the, the work that I do. I think it's important to first say, what is a microaggression? Can you all see this, the screen? I'll add it up right now. Yeah. The screen is black right now. Um, I'm gonna try again. Um, all right. Hopefully now. If not, I'll just talk. Um, can you see okay. it now? I will put it up. I see it. Let me put it up now. There you go. It's up. Okay. Yeah, there were a number of different pictures that went forward, but this is fine because this is kind of the the everyday uh, reality. So microaggressions, it's important to first talk about what they are. We think of them as a form of everyday racism, verbal or nonverbal, layered and cumulative assaults used to keep those at the racial margins in their place. That that really is coming from my my one of my mentors, Daniel Solorsono, who's done work on microaggressions since 1998, along with Lindsay Pettis Huber, and and we're trying to uplift. Chester Pierce's framing. I like to think of microaggressions as everyday reminders and reinforcers of our history of suffering and structural positions in an unjust society. So they're different from implicit bias, which really deal with intentions uh, sent by perpetrators of harm that don't match their, their, those intentions don't match their actions, right? So when you're looking at bias, you're really studying the perpetrator of a potential moment of harm. We're studying microaggressions you're studying the impact of these moments, particularly on black people. And I say black people because we get microaggressions from Chester Pierce. And Chester Pierce is a psychiatrist, an educator at Harvard. He developed the term microaggressions back in the 1960s. Um, and he doesn't get enough credit for the work that he did. In fact, most people, when they're talking about microaggressions, rarely will we, will we frame it as something that came literally from a black person who was sitting with black clientele every day um, the person who, who gave us, uh, one of the people who gave us Sesame Street, that's Pierce there. He, he wanted to find a way to talk about what black people in uh, Cambridge were experiencing when they were, they were being treated in a certain way, but no one was saying something explicitly. So he called them daily uh, experiences, sort of daily uh, reminders of, of our slave status, of our status as in, of, of non-human. And to your point about the, the everydayness versus the major stuff, Pierce called microaggressions either micro terrors, which he called the everyday reality that, that's faced with black people where you're you know, mistaken as, a, as a someone who might be a slave or you know, people think you're, you're gonna steal from them or you, know, you might be harassed by police, et cetera, to a micro torture. And those are events that, that cause us to try to conform into a white supremacist society. You think about torturing someone, you want them to change their behavior. So we're tortured to an extent that we all have to act, talk, think, and be a certain way just to get by to micro disasters. And that's for Pierce, a micro disaster was a, uh, you know, a moment like this murder of George Floyd or Ahmaud Aubrey or Breonna Taylor, these, these uh, events that cause us to, to sort of stop what we're doing 
in the moment and that black people are exposed to all the time. So these micro terrorist tortures and disasters are typically understood as a sort of small uh, incidents, but he never meant small. He, he meant what he said when he said micro, he was thinking, think Broffenbrenner, right? So we might be familiar with that, micro, meso, macro. So for Pierce, the micro, that was the, that was the everyday experience where the meso might be the institutional laws or policies or procedures that make that experience stick. And the macro would be the underlying historical reality that gives us the microaggression. So micro doesn't mean small. Micro means everyday, incessant, insidious, nonstop, right? Uh, just, to, just to frame it in that way. And so those everyday experiences that I study did imp were implicated on Tilmer Lane and some of the black men that we looked at at UCLA and that they were experiencing everyday racism as a form of, of stress. And I have some interesting findings to share if we want to talk about that or, or, or wait for, for yeah. later. No, go, go into it. Let's, oh, okay. I'm, I'm good. Go right on into it. Okay, cool. Um, so for me, the just to give a sense here, can y'all still see the screen? Hopefully. Uh, put it up, put it, pull it up again, if you don't mind. Okay, I'm gonna. Oh. All right, there you are. Okay. It just went off though. Oh, I think okay. when you go, when you're going to a uh, uh, slideshow, maybe it, it, it goes it, away for. Okay. Can you see it or, or do I need to do it again? Yeah, one more time. All right. But if not, you're such a descriptive uh, orator. I, I, I'm sure we can all kind of how about now? Picture it. Is it there? No, no, no. It's not oh, okay. there. All right, that's that's all good. Um, because so I'll tell you what, I don't want this presentation that's meant for good to cause you harm to your telomeres from the stress. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no. we know that that stress yeah, is cumulative. Yeah. Well, sorry about the the technical difficulties. I can talk through this. Um, I wanted to know, and I came to this because I have family members, uh, when I'm starting my PhD program, black men in my family who were dying, you know, one from uh, a heart attack, a uh, second major heart attack by the time he was 60 years old, um, passed away on the, on basically right after we did admittance weekend at UCLA, you know? So uh, he passed away, my, uh, think of Uncle Derek, and then my, uncles um, developed, all of them, all of my, my uncles I'm closest to developed a form of, of prostate cancer and, uh, and other kinds of illnesses within my first year at UCLA. And then of course we had Trayvon Martin being murdered, Mike Brown, Eric Garner, uh, uh, all these other, all these John Crawford, all these other folks, Tamir Rice were killed within my first year there. And I really went to UCLA to study what's, how could we change education to help black people um, and, and I found myself thinking, how do we address premature death? What is premature death? How do we get to premature death, premature aging? And everything that I was seeing, I learned about an uncle who had, he said he had the, the fat deposits in his neck at 30 years old. They told him it was the fat deposits of a 60 year old. You know, family members uh, uh, in, my, in my household who, who couldn't sleep, they couldn't sleep because of dysregulations you're talking about. The cortisol, were, were, they, their adrenaline was shooting when it was time to go to sleep. So it's this regulation. I learn and learn. And then what we're hearing is that it's this everyday stress. So that's why I started looking at microaggressions. And I did it with these black men at UCLA, relatively healthy. They had to be healthy to be in the study. Um, and the question was, does recognizing racial microaggressions that you're experiencing, what does that do? Or does it have any sort of relationship with your telomere length? What we found is that black men uh, who were able to see a lot of the racism they were experiencing on campus, you know, they, you're familiar with UCLA, we had those stairs that Eddie Murphy ran up on Nutty Professor, John Steps. I had a student in the study who said, you know, every time I walk up those stairs with all the students, uh, I hear them check their pockets as I walk by them, you know, looking to see if their wallet is still there. You know, other students talked about, um, you know, going to get an exam that they did well on it, and the TA or the professor being unsure if they were the actual student who did well on the exam or, or, the, uh, or the, the paper. Um, and, and questioning whether or not they had cheated or if they were filling in for someone else. Um, uh, to, to seeing the names of buildings being named after people who practiced the eugenics, you know, the eugenicist movement. 
um, that those kinds of experiences, everyday experiences, to people running away from you when you're trying to give them your parking pass because they're thinking that you're trying to attack them. That, that Those were stuff that the guys were reporting, going to frat parties and being told, you can't come in because there's too many of you here, right? If there was one of you, it'd be fine, but you brought three of your boys, so that, that's not gonna work. Um, and what we saw is that the guys who, who saw those for what they were as racism, as everyday racism, microaggressions, and didn't internalize it to the self, they were less likely to engage in some of the maladaptive coping that you all probably talk about. And they had a practice of sort of coping with them that was healthy, that was grounded in sort of a spiritual practice, uh, even doing art or, or, or creating music, but it was tied to anticipating threat. They came to campus every day knowing in my body, in my being, I'm someone who is, who is threatening because UCLA was never intended for me. I'm essentially an unwelcomed or at least an uneasy guest here. And I understand that history, which is we only have 55 years of conditional humanity, right? 65, 64 mm -hmm. voting rights. So I understand 55 years is not undoing the entirety of, of anti-black history or reality. So I know where, I, where I'm at versus the guys who, who kind of were not thinking that those moments as racism or were uncomfortable with calling it that. So maybe their parents mm -hmm. told them, you know, no excuses, you can't make excuses, you gotta pull your pants up, speak properly, keep going. Um, there was a difference in their telomere lengths. So the guys who recognize racism every day, they tended to have longer telomeres relative to the guys who, who were experiencing racism but weren't calling it that, right? And, and, and so there's a way that I think we can talk about coping or, or education that might be important to share with some of the viewers of this. I'm sorry, my daughter's having stuff to say about it too. Um, but that, that's, that's sort of what we found from the, from the, from the study. Um, and I, I can say that another pretty alarming reality is that not just within group, because a lot of telomere studies are done within, and this was a cross-sectional study within Black Men at UCLA. But we also, at the lab I'm at, the Health Equity Research Lab, they've done a study, it's 2018, that looked at uh, breast cancer survivors, women who were over the age of 40 who had survived a form of breast cancer some stage four survivors. Um, and the guys in our study, about 30% of the, of the men in our study had telomere lengths, relative telomere lengths that were either at or below or lower, shorter than some of those breast cancer survivors. None wow. of the guys in our study were over the age of 26. They were all, their average age was around 21. That's crazy. And wow. It didn't matter, right? So that, that's the kind of reality that we see happening later in life with our premature or our early deaths it seems like it's it's happening or it's starting to accumulate when we're younger. At least it's some of the implications. Of the that is actually quite. That's profound. crazy. That's yeah. crazy. Kendra, so much. Yeah. 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 You know, I mean, just 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 to just to put that into words. So what you're saying is that women who have who have babies who are having you know who have issues and so forth in terms of their the mental functioning, that women who go through breast cancer, their telomeres are shortened, that allegedly healthy young black men have telomeres on par with these middle-aged women who are survivors of breast cancer or struggling. Uh-oh. I think we lost you. I think he froze, but let me let me jump in. The, what what I find so scary about that though is this is you know what we're in is is ubiquitous in this country. Um, so if if students at UCLA, which by almost by definition, and and one of my one of my my like he's like my godson, he graduated from UCLA just a couple years ago. Um, you know, if these guys who are almost you know these guys are top of the class brilliant young men, you know, working hard to, 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 to make a life for themselves, you know, to, to improve themselves. And, and like you said, they're there to learn. Some of them, their parents have told them, look, just suck it up, pull up your pants and keep going. While others, you know, have learned kind of some coping mechanisms or actually I would say better than coping mechanisms. They've learned like, like thrive mechanisms. Like how do I thrive in a situation? But right. imagine all of those young men in our country who don't have that. You know what I'm saying? Imagine all of the young men in our country who, don't even don't have any framework um, who are who are who have, you know, I, in my family, at least, you know, I've looked at uh, several of our young men who dropped out of school in the 10th grade. Um, 
you know, and and didn't go on, and got caught, and some got caught up in the um, prison industrial complex. What is? I mean, can you imagine? I, you know, I, I would be, be curious to see what their telomere length look like when they're at the at the worst, yeah. the worst end of the spectrum of what America's racism looks like. Yeah. So we did. You know, thank thankfully we were able to do some focus group conversations with the guys, and I want to be clear because I you know love these students and. There is no good or bad. Any right. one thing that Fanon, Friends Fanon teaches us, because I'm seeing folks say, wow, and that's a lot. One thing that Friends Fanon teaches us is when he was doing his work, you may know his psychiatry work in, in, in uh, Algeria, as there was a decolonization effort going on, he was, he was treating uh, black people who were colonized in, in Algeria, um, and he was also treating uh, some of the colonizers, right, for, for psychiatric issues. And what they wanted him to do was to help those people who were colonized, those black people, be able to cope with their environment, right? And so he, he found that eventually, this is something that Lewis Gordon has talked about. He found that eventually as a, a really unethical venture because he was basically saying, once they leave my, once they leave my uh, office, the violent situation persists. So trying to make someone essentially be a happy slave doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It's actually unethical, uh, okay, right? So I'm uh, not saying that there, there's, there is a, a good way to respond to racial violence. We exist in a place of racial violence. And so some of the guys in our study have some of those characteristics that you mentioned. They had been incarcerated as youth. So in, 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 as youth, and what we found is for them, it didn't make a difference how they, uh, how they responded to the racism. They, they knew that they were experiencing racism and their cells were still deteriorating at the same rate as those who were maybe less less aware. Um, and yeah, it, it does, acknowledging, it, it's essentially not being gaslit, right? I think of it like uh, as family folks who, who box. If you walk into a ring and you don't have your, your hands up, you're gonna <laughs> get hit, right? You're gonna get hit. But if you walk into a ring like this, you're gonna get hit, but you're gonna get less, you're gonna get hit less. And so I think about it, it's just about educating folks that we are in a ring. This break is not, we've had 55 years of conditional humanity. Just 55 years. We, we, slavery begins here in 1619. We go from 1619 to 1865. 1865 to 1965 is apartheid. We've had 55 years of total conditional humanity. So what we're, what we're supposed to do in response to that is develop some really healthy coping mechanism, but Ultimately, I don't want to blame anyone for being harmed. If that makes sense, I want to try no, that makes perfect to, sense. to respond to that harm. I, because I think you're right. I think what what can often happen is you can, but you're right. You can't make a good or bad in how people respond because you don't want to make double victimize somebody. Right. Um, you know, and and inside of our community, sometimes we can do some things like that. So we do have to be careful. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about what. Um, what is what? It, what are some of the tactics that can be used to be protective? Um, because I, you know, I don't want to leave people without hope. Uh, we'll get into nutrition and stuff, but I want to make this clear: as much as our, 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 you know, we do a lot of work around plant-based nutrition, going back to the way our That's ancestors right. ate on the continent. Um, you know, we we understand that this is bigger than that, and that yeah. there's more that has to be removed. Um, but that is one of the key components that you can do because the the very food that we are fed, which is how we get the name slave food, was a part of our enslavement, right? I mean, right. you wanted people weak enough, you wanted to feed people enough so that they could work all day, but not enough so that they could rebel, <laughs> not enough so they would rise up. Um, and that's feeding them physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally. You didn't want to do that. That still happens to this day. So when you look at responding to these microaggressions and the stressors, how you're fed matters. But let's go beyond. Let's we'll come back around to that in other, you know, if not, even if not tonight in other episodes. What else can be done? What are we supposed to be telling our our young men, especially, but also our young women? I mean, who who are obviously getting affected by this? When you look at stress and racism, breast cancer rates, and things like that. Yeah, most definitely. I, I think I can go actually to food and uplift some of the work that I'm learning with uh, my colleague Tiffany Marie up in the Bay. She's doing a longitudinal telomere study as well. I don't have to talk about the study, but I can say that one thing Tiff and I talk about is this really powerful practice of, of, of our ancestors braiding okra into the hair of folks on those, on those voyages, right? Um, that if you went into the slave castles in Elmina, for instance, in, in West Africa, uh, stripped 
right? You went onto the, those those ships after you left the door of no return with with nothing uh, but your body. But somehow our folks found a way to braid okra into into the hair, um, and that okra okra seeds okra seeds, right? And those okra seeds um, we utilize as as food eventually. Um, it was a it was a passage. It was a passage of of so much more than just the food, but the the knowledge, the wisdom of the that food as medicine, as sustenance. And I think that what's happened is that much of what we had has been severed. So that's what I call microaggressions, everyday reminders. Yeah. Is that they force us to time travel to a place not of our choosing, right? And what I think is a possible response to that are micro maybe affirmations or time traveling of our choosing, a remembering of sorts of the kind of food that you all lift up in its, pro its, its principles, its possibilities as medicine. So I would say that that was implicated. A lot of guys with longer telomeres were talking about what they ate and they were talking about their, their engagement with food as medicine or plants as medicine or having relationships with plants, which is what our indigenous ancestors knew, understood, and we can still access same cells we, we that we got from trauma, those cells we get from times before trauma. We still got all of right. that information right. embedded within us. I'd also say that just if you're talking about your, your let's say I have a son who's going to go to UCLA. My, my goddaughter, is, my godson uh, is, is uh, you know, a, a good soccer player. He might be going to a, to a, a historically white institution uh, any, 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 any year now, right? Um, and I'm, I'm wondering what I tell his parents. What are you going to tell him about what he needs to do if he goes to this place? I think know where you are, know thyself, know where you are, know the history of what you're entering into. Because microaggressions mm. harm us when they surprise us. When mm. we participate and we, we expect, that's some of the socialization messages that the parents were offering to their kids. Because they were offering these messages during Trayvon and all the other stuff, right? So expect that you might have not great interactions with law enforcement. Don't, and don't not expect that. Don't not anticipate that. And there's a there's a fine line that you probably know about between anticipatory stress and, and, and not being aware enough. So being too hyper vigilant versus not being aware. And I think that the youth were were really prepared by these loving, all the parents are loving, but these parents who maybe had more information about how you walk that line of both acknowledging that we are in a situation as descendants of captives and that has not been reconciled, redressed, et cetera. So any given moment, it could be dangerous for you. And also, here's how you can live your life in a grounded way. So that was one thing, just being aware. Other stuff that you could do, in addition to being aware, is have some kind of ritual or process that you go through. And that ritual for me includes food, right? Which is a process of feeding or fueling my body. But another form of ritual is a, a spiritual practice or grounding that allows the, the mind where stress is processed and then created you know, sort of pathways to the body allows the mind to rest. We have to find places for our minds to rest. We can do that through uh, uh, sort of mindfulness meditation. Um, I practice Ifa. There are other ways, regardless of your spiritual orientation, a practice that grounds and roots us into a deeper knowing. I, I like to uplift the principles of Ubuntu, right? I am because we are. So much of our thinking has been created through colonization that uh, I think, therefore, I am, which is very individualistic. I am because we are ties us to a broader community. And having a broader community is also really important. If you're going to go to an all-white space. Who are your people? Where are they at? That may be a first thing that you think about. Where are my people at? Go there. If you're on a campus like UCLA, I know one of the, the, the spaces the students talked about all the time was the bunch center, which is a, a the black the black studies space. They go there, even if they're not studying black studies, they would hang out there. That was their safe space, their sanctuary. Wow. We got a whole space for each other and we need to have spaces of healing, whether that uh, therapy spaces, I think a lot of collective trauma work could be done. There's an amazing uh, scholar out here, Cheryl Grills, who does emotional emancipation circles. I think that having access to that can help us deal with this daily grind. And then also just giving permission to not internalize the racism as implicative of who your true self is. Yeah. Know that these are lies that were really created to create the world around us, but they don't need to be lies that create us. 
And I think that that's the major uh, sort of takeaway I would say for this is finding ways to moderate stress. The guys were doing art, they were listening or creating music. They had a way of sort of anticipating the stress. They avoided hostile situations. They ran towards black community and they, they were really aware of their, of our relation with each other as black people, our relation to the earth, which I think brings us into relation with our food. Um, so that would be my suggestion. That was, that was profound. And you know, let me tell you something, you struck a chord with me because I left Connecticut, moved to Miami when I was in the 10th grade. I wound up going to one of the top 50 high schools in the country. What I didn't know, or my mother didn't know when she got us into such a really good school was, it was full of uh, kids who were, if they weren't actually neo-Nazis, they were uh, neo-Nazi sympathizers. Um, I remember when they, they put swastikas on the synagogue across the street. And every day when I went to school, I got called the N-word so much. I joke in some of my presentations that if I had $5 for every time they called me the N-word, I could have paid for college cash. Um, and, you know, it, 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 was tra it was honestly traumatic. Um, I remember sitting in class. Um, when the Washington Redskins went to the Super Bowl and there was an actual discussion around Doug Williams' ability mm -hmm. to actually be smart, black people being smart enough to play quarterback. Um, I'm the only black man in the room, um, you know, and it's just sitting there like, yo, like, like is this really happening um, in a time when I didn't have a safe space? You know I mean? I, I, there was no safe space for me except church. You know, the weekends were safe because when I would go to church, you know, I could actually, I felt like I was in a warm location again. Mm -hmm. uh, I left there and went to an a HBCU, and I have to say it was it was well needed. We, Columbus and I both went to Oakwood University um, mm -hmm. in Northern Alabama, and it was really put me put my mind at ease. I got like you said, rest four years of rest in a sense. Um, and then I went to Wake Forest University for one year and did a post baccalaureate program and was back in it. And what I quickly found was that the the black students who seemed to cope the best with being on a campus like that, which is probably similar to UCLA at the time, you know, back then, maybe even worse, actually. Um, I didn't, I had no bad experiences like I did in high school, but I just knew where to go. Like, it was different. Like, you know, it, it was like we pulled it apart and created our own little safe zone, like you're saying, because I just knew where I didn't belong, as sad as that is to say. Um, and so that, you know, that experience uh, taught me a lot about in life, making sure that you always remember kind of where your bread is buttered. You understand who family is so that you have that protection that comes from a collectiveness. There's power in collectiveness. That's why some animals run in packs or lions run in prides because there's power and, and safety in that. And I like what you said about all of it because one of the things that happened to me during that time in high school is you began to, you, there were times you wished you weren't black. And I would have to say that's probably one of the most traumatic things that can happen is when you're sitting in a room, you're just as intelligent. In fact, I used to outshine the other students a lot of times. Mm -hmm. But you know, when I was in an advanced placement, honors classes, and I would feel like, man, if I just wasn't black because of the, the neg constant, constant negativity. And I even remember someone close to our family saying to me during that same time period, separate from school, you'd be so handsome if you weren't so dark. Mm -hmm. And I want to say that that is part of what is so damaging about what we're in, because you carry that. But I also want to say, and, and, I'll, and I'll let Columbus jump in or you jump back in. What, it's interesting you say what you say, because it's like, it's like looking back at my life, it all makes sense. That's the time I was most creative. I used to draw. I can't draw at all, but I would draw. I would go back home every day. I would draw little pictures up all over my wall of what I would draw. But it was also very culturally centered. This is when I started studying black history, Ethiopian history, going way back before slavery is what I wanted. Mm -hmm. um, number one, and then number two, I you know I even started. I could join. A, I had a reggae band and a rap group. I was most creative in the time when I was. I felt most depressed. So mm -hmm. what you're saying to me really resonates that some of the guys also did that. And um, you know, and I, I think that's something we want to mention is that let your soul, you know, express the pain in a very healthy way. Art is one of those ways. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'll chime in real briefly. And sorry, I had to leave you all briefly. Technology was just trying to ice me out. But I didn't. I didn't experience overt issues growing up as a kid, but as I look back, I experienced so many small, continual chips at me. When I went to a predominantly Caucasian high school, junior high school, and part of my elementary. And I can honestly say in retrospect, it wasn't that I had developed a sense of confidence, a sense of 
knowing who I was, despite a very strong, strong family dynamic, until I went to this historically black college and university that gave me a sense of grounding. It gave me a sense of grounding and self-assuredness that, you know what, I am good enough. Yep. You know what, I am confident. And so, so much so that just like Eric brought up is that when I went to med school, I found myself, although I'm comfortable with all ethnicities, completely comfortable, I found myself still gravitating away off campus still with with those who looked like me and had shared experiences like me. And that was so encouraging and so important in my development as a young med school student and as a young physician. And you fast forward now to things that I've experienced, still microaggressions where folks look at me and wonder, well, that's not the chief of, of the department or Mm -hmm. That's not the interventional cardiologist that you must be here to take out the trash or you must be here as a different level of of professionalism, a therapist or something, but not the physician. Right. That has given me a level of foundation that I'm comfortable with it. And I expect it to come like you were saying that expectation almost I've, I've heard other psychologists bring out that challenge response is so important versus looking at it as this is something detrimental, but it's like rising to the challenge and recognizing this stressor that's coming is aiming for me, but I'm recognizing how I'm feeling and I'm embracing it. I'm moving, I'm moving away from it. And so, man, I love the work that you've done and really highlighting and bringing this yeah. stuff out. It's like powerful. Yeah. It's powerful. Oh yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. I, I, I would also maybe add is that what's difficult about the constant stress is that so many of our institutions, and I can talk specifically about school or educational spaces, what we're also seeing is that when we do things the traditional way, and I say traditional meaning Eurocentric ways, as the Eurocentric ways of being um, dominate our institutions, whether it is healthcare or education, um, that also has implications for our Kilmer link. And that when we re-indigenize or root ourselves back into a deeper way of being that was with us longer and before a lot of these intrusions on our education. So when I say schooling, I don't mean education. Um, that, that that impacts our telomere lengths. So the guys that were accessing other ways of getting educated that weren't super reliant on this hyper-competitive, capitalistic kind of framework of schooling, they were healthier. I mean, that's just, that is just what, what, what is true. And that, none of this is gonna contradict the knowledge that we get from our parents or our grandparents or aunties, right? You know, this is what we've been told over and over again. And the other thing I felt to mention was love. That when, when people were reporting that they felt like they had support from other people around them, that that also was a way of moving life into us. So we can yeah. do that for each other. Microaffirmations, nodding to each other when we see each other. Yes. Like, like acknowledging yeah. each other, reaching out and giving each other um, unconditional forms of love and support, uh, I think are, are also important. It's something I'm learning from Dr. Tiffany Marie uh, uh, from her work. Yeah. Awesome. No, extremely, ex extremely powerful, extremely powerful. You know, I think that's one of the things it, it all ties into one of the things I'm not sure if you all mentioned this when we, we kind of went when I got lost for a moment. But another component of our equations that we come up with is really our health being tied to our resiliency over our stress. And this really absolutely mm. fits that. Because what we're saying is we're saying that these are all efforts to build our resiliency, to help us offset these stressors that are going to happen. They're going to happen in life. And what's key, what also I'm hearing in here is once again, is that this stress is damaging to everyone, every American, period. And so as African-Americans and Hispanics and individuals in this, in this world, we all have those stressors, but we have another layer of stress, Right. another layer of stress that separates. And this may be something we can point to, not maybe, it is something we can point to as a causative component to these health disparities that we're, we're facing. Powerful. Yeah. And um, I just want to comment, Barbara Davis just made a comment there about most of our young kids are not hearing how good they are and how they can achieve because of that. They're not having that sense of self-worth. Um, Barbara Davis is the superintendent of, of schools for a large uh, dis uh, 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 Christian school district across the state of Florida. Um, so uh, when she says that African-American students, um, that's pretty profound because that is exactly what gets damaged 
is your sense of self value. And I would mm -hmm. argue that is one of the most damaging chronic yes. Um, stressors is when you look in the mirror, you think, I wish I was somebody else. I wish I looked different. Um, I've heard, I've heard many, uh, African Americans say this in my life. And like I said, I've thought it my own self at times, like, man, if only I were, um, you know, yeah. I would be better off. And so, um, this is something that is damaging, but can be reversed, um, by a lot of what you said. And, 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 and Dr. Watson is saying some pretty profound stuff in terms of yes. how to reverse this. Um, so I hope. Oh, people get get that um, because these are the kind of things we do need to bring into our, our, our young men. I was fortunate, like I said, on, on the weekends at church, I got was given a lot of these tools and a lot of this encouragement. Some of the mothers would, you know, pull you aside and tell you how proud they were of you mm -hmm. and, and so forth. And that went a long way in fueling you to, to it, into 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 quote unquote success. But I think more of it is into um, being able to thrive in the face of what's going on. And that's what we, we've we got to begin, begin to do. It's not enough for us to survive. we got to thrive because we got to build a nation. We, we you know, there's, there's, there's things that we have to do that are unique if we're really going to reverse, if we're going to remove um, the stressors. I think the secret to that, in my opinion, is always going to be to build, to bring, to bring to the table your own so that you're not asking for anything else and you're not, you know, being looked down upon when you have your own. Yeah, and there's this strange, this strange sort of contract that we have um, about about what it takes to build, and it's really tied to this idea that you need to put in a lot of work, especially in schooling. And I always just say, I mean, I don't know what you all about, but C O L L E G E is a weird way to spell F O O D, right? It's just a <laughs> weird way to spell that. Um, or achievement is a weird way if you spell out achievement to spell shelter. And I think that part of what we need to do is find ways to give, give our folks what we need to be and then allow the, the brilliance that we know is, is yes. in us to expand yeah. and, and grow and be, and, and but we got to take care of baseline needs first. You yeah. know, we need a collective effort towards that. Agreed. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the conversation has been um, amazing and we've received a lot of comments, more so comments and questions. Um, so I think that the tone that you guys are striking in terms of what you're sharing is 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 pretty relevant. One of the questions that um, Dr. Watson, I know that you have shared, um, your study was primarily on African-American males. Are there similar stories that, um, that, that focus on the African-American female, which we know at this point is kind of the lowest paid, um, you know, who has to handle and carry the weight of not just the black male on her shoulders, but herself and her families. Um, do you have any studies other than the breast um, cancer study as it relates to African-American females? That breast cancer study does have a group of black women who are black cisgender women who are um, the lowest, you know, they have the lowest telomere out of all those folks and it didn't really matter socioeconomic status wise. So, but we already know that black women get breast cancer less than, than other folks, but die more often. Uh, I read, yeah. um, and of course, you know, black trans women have an average lifespan around 35 years. So this is something that affects people across gender identity I would just point to uh, Amani uh, Allen or Newer Jeter, who's been doing a lot of this work with black women, looking at superhuman schema or threat. I think her, another another colleague that we have at SF State, Marilyn Thomas, uh, is been doing some of that work with Dr. Allen. Um, so Dr. Thomas has been doing that. And then I think, uh, hopefully y'all, I don't know if you, you can, but you know, Tiffany Marie it has done a work, some, some work with, with youth who are black, and brown, who have multiple genders, and uh, her, her findings are pretty pr profound as well about telomere length. And the reason I looked at black men is because, you know, we black black men, what, that, that's how I identify. And also because we we die earlier than other folks and we have uh, a certain kind of morbidity happening. It's like, what is our, the second leading cause of death between, uh, for black men ages 20 to 44 is heart disease. And so I'm thinking about that as a, as a reality that's implicated in my life. I'm learning that from a student of mine, Jacques was sure. Um, but that, that's the, the, the goal is to continue doing this with black students of all genders. We're, we're actually in the midst of collecting a sample right now across the country, um, uh, for, or asking black folks to give us information about their, their cells and their, their stories. Um, so hopefully that will help us think about black students regardless of their gender identity. Okay. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm gonna jump in real. I'm gonna jump in real quick because I know you gave us a little teaser 
about your colleagues' work and some of the outcomes and the studies with oxytocin and some of the other responses. I don't know if you feel comfortable kind of sharing that because I think there was some hope that was built in there with some of the information yeah. that you gave. Yeah, so Tiffany Marie, a uh, scholar who did her uh, PhD at um, uh, Berkeley, while I was at UCLA, she was up north and we, were, we didn't know we were doing similar stuff. Um, first education scholars to really think about this in that way with, with uh, Tillamar Lane. And she looked at a group of youth longitudinally, which I think is so powerful. Because my study's cross-sectional. Most Tillamar studies cross-sectional. We were looking at people at one point in time. Tiffany looked at folks across time. And these young, some of these young folks she was working with had Tillamar lengths shorter than, than all those women in the breast cancer study. Um, and they were 14 years old. Um, but they experienced extreme form of work experience and extreme forms of stress. She also looked at oxytocin levels, which we know of as the love hormone. So if mom is breastfeeding, baby and mom both get level, elevated oxytocin levels if you pet your dog, vice versa. And Tiffany was able to observe Tillamar length, not just pausing some of the deterioration, but regrowth in Tillamar length. And saw that with uh, the students after one year of doing some work uh, with them. Um, and saw an elevated level in their oxytocin levels. Um, which they attributed, the students were telling stories about how they felt they had at least one person who loved them unconditionally mm -hmm. in the school space. And that yeah. love wasn't contingent upon how they were performing in the classroom. And I'll also add that what she also, what I think Tiff would probably talk about is say that really it's these, nor what we call normative practices of schooling, the high stakes testing, the, the grading, the, the competition, the ways that schools are, are constructed, which is, if you look at the history of schools, that was always against us, right? Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it. White architects of black education, you can go read that book and talk about how schools were constructed specifically to undo our lives. So when Tiff mm -hmm. said, when we don't fall into the trappings of schooling, um, our telomeres tend to respond and, and reverse and, and grow. And so for that, I mean, I think it means that we have to re- we need to get back into remembering our ways of being with each other that are outside of the conditions that have been created for us. Of course, we have to we have to deal with this because this is the world we're in. But we got to start building spaces that give us capacity to not be in this world um, in, in the same way. And the students who attend like the historical black college and university, and I know Columbus and Eric mentioned the school that we attend at Oakwood University. Um, are, so you're finding that when black students attend traditional black, white schools, they tend to congregate with each other to get that extra strength and support. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We haven't. I haven't done a, a HBCU represented or, or comparative sample. That's part of the study. This the the data collection we're doing this summer is we have some students from an HBCU, students from okay. a white space across the country. But I think what's important about TIF study is that that school is majority black and brown you know, where we had really short telomere length. So as I would say, a prison is a very diverse place, right? A lot of black folk. Just because we got folks in the space doesn't always mean it's healthy. And so we have to like challenge ourselves to think about what is, what's a healthy congregation of us. And I, I would look to some of the HBCUs. I, I'm not familiar with the one y'all went to, but it sounds like it was a space that was protective. My goal is to try to build protective spaces in our educational uh, uh, space as much as we can for as many people as we can. Yeah. No, that that's such a powerful, that's such a powerful reflection of that study because it not only instills hope, letting us know that that it's not destiny. So even though you start out and you're struck by all these stressors that are there that shorten your telomeres, this is similarly reflective of the the work that's been done inside of medicine, looking at the extension of telomeres, the regression of prostate cancer, the regression of coronary disease through stress modification, nutrition, and lifestyle ventures that you actually can turn, turn things around. And so what you're saying to me, it, it resonates so powerfully that for in these youth, they're not lost. They're not lost and we, and we have to form as a community a way in which we can really shift the, to turn the tides to help them improve. Huge, right. hugely powerful. Are there some foods that you guys would recommend as it relates to ad addressing, you know, the telomeres? I'm, 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 I'm ears open for this one from you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll start off and then Eric, you go ahead and chime in. Uh, so I believe it was Elizabeth, Elizabeth Blackburn, 
who got led out with doing a lot of work as it relates to telomeres. And so she worked with Dean Ornish, who is a, a physician based on a lot of work in the cardiology uh, sphere. And what they did was they looked at the telomere length of individuals who adopted a whole food plant-based diet. And, but it was not in isolation. So from a, a scientific rigor, it wasn't one that separated this out as the one unifying approach. But they looked at those who adopted a whole food plant-based diet in conjunction with exercise, in conjunction with stress reduction type of, of activities. And they found that the telomere lengths actually improved. They lengthened. And those individuals who undertook that versus those who remained on the traditional conventional therapy of foods and so forth. So there's power that's there. And this, this information also transformed into the prostate specific antigens, the PSA levels dropping it, transformed into improving blood flow to the heart muscle too as well by looking at eating real food, whole food as the primary source, food that is from indigenous countries around the globe, the blue zones as we like to call it, or in mother Africa too as well eating the roots and the tubers and the green leafy vegetables there. And I, and I would throw in there that part of, uh, you know, I, I think over time we may find that there is some connection. I, I keep bringing up inflammation um, that might can tie some of this stuff together. Um, and so we do know that one of the things that is necessary when you eat is to eat anti-inflammatory foods. Yes. Um, and so leafy green vegetables, dark berries, blackberries, blueberries, uh, some of them have a compound called resveratrol. Uh, one study showed it can actually shorten the length of a viral illness. Um, and so, you know, especially as we deal with this pandemic right now, um, anything that you can do to be less inflammatory on a physiological uh, mm -hmm. level is going to be very protective long term. Um, and so um, all of those all of those things are important, but I'd also throw in there um, uh, 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 lentils and, and beans yeah. um, as foods that are very healthy. And then when you go to Africa, there's a lot of peas, a lot of beans, um, different, different types. I was shocked um, when I was in Ghana um, and I went to one of the slave castles and I have to tell you, it's, there's a weeping you do um, in the slave castle that you, that, that is like nothing else um, as you stand and realize what happened. Um, and so I was really glad to hear you talk about the okra seeds being braided into the hair uh, because literally they braided in a piece of the mother continent and brought those healing foods along with them. I'd not heard that before. So that was actually very powerful. Yeah. 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 Learn that from I'll, Tiffany. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, uh, that, that's huge. I'll chime in just because it, it reminds me of the nutritional stress aspect. And uh, this is not scientific, but my my view of the world is that nutritional stress is not just about eating uh, disease forming foods. It's about the absence of health promoting foods. Right. And so when we look at nutritional stress, these stressors, they attack our body from foods that, as Eric brought up, are, are inflammatory that lead to these things called advanced glycated end products that kind of essentially almost brown your arteries on the inside and destroy your vessels, that they lead to this oxidative stress, as we all know, is the rusting of the pipes and things of that nature. And so when you're eating foods that don't turn brown, right, your blueberries, your blackberries, your raspberries, your strawberries, your green leafy vegetables, those are rich in antioxidants. There's so much power pack that's there to help the body to decrease inflammation that can also help to stay the tide of disease burden that's there for both chronic and for even acute. We're mm -hmm. arming our bodies at every turn. It's about either arming ourselves towards health or emboldening uh, uh, illness there. Mm -hmm. So I know that we've mentioned about acknowledging the racism, um, you know, on a on a you know, on a mental level helps us reduce the stress of, of us facing that. Can you guys elaborate on that a little bit more in terms of how that is arming, I guess, our, our children and ourselves as we deal with racism, micro or, or, or not? Yeah, sure. You know, when I, when I was raised out in Reno Valley in Riverside, the belief was that um, there was a possibility of a multicultural, um, diverse future free from the the, the ravages of the very recent past, right? The 60s and 70s. So my dad's from Kansas City, Missouri. My mom's from Louisiana. They, they moved to Marina Valley. It's this military town and um, had this goal or hope. I went to a mostly white, you could say it was multicultural, but it was mostly white elementary school. It had corporal punishment though, right? So if you, uh, the, the thing was they had those red, green and yellow things on the, on the wall and 
If you were on red, you get kicked out. You get kicked out of the classroom. And getting kicked out, you had a choice, either be suspended or take SWATs, right? And I remember when in kindergarten, uh, by October in kindergarten, I walk in, say hello to Mrs. Friesen. She say, hello, Ken, just go ahead. And I go to the front and I change my card from green to yellow, right? That was That was her response to me. So every day I sat in class, so my parents were not gonna take the suspension route. I sat in class in kindergarten knowing that if I did one thing, I was gonna get swatted with a wooden paddle by a white principal. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that that came from a, um, and I love my my parents and think that they were doing everything they could to try to help have us, uh, get us a good, I guess, life. My mom drove the bus for the school, did everything for the school just so we could go there, this parochial school. But I think that they were coming from this mindset that the things that were need not be in the moment, in the mm-hmm. present. The things that used to be, used to define black life, don't need to be what define black in the future. And I think the reality is that we're dealing with a racism that that hasn't gone away. It's it's mutated, it's adapted, it's changed forms, it's shed skin and put on other kinds of skin. But it's never really gone away. And I, I don't know that it will, right, in a country that's built on slavery and of course colonization of indigenous people's spaces and their lives. So I think that what I would argue is that what we need to do is prepare our folks to deal with that everyday threat, which I don't think is so hard in the moment like right now, where it's so apparent. But we need to be vigilant in preparing for strategies of dealing with everyday racism, chronic racism, institutional racism, and structural racism, the historical reality, while we also work to, to try to change our local, I think on very local levels, how our people are treated on a day-to-day basis. But I think that a lot of this has to come from community and self-reliance, which, which um, I'm happy to you know, talk more about it another time, but uh, we get a lot of really good insight in from, from some advocates and, and folks who are doing this work on the ground about what we need to do to change society. But we can change ourselves by just expecting we're gonna experience racism and helping our youth prepare for that. There's a question from an ally, um, and the question is, any advice for Caucasians on how to be supportive and or protective of the Black community? Y'all want to take that one? or uh, I'm, hey, they, I'm sure. <laughs> You can I'm go ahead. <laughs> yeah. You're on a roll. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think that uh, white people exist in this country structurally, right, as first as, as settlers. They come... Uh, unannounced, without permission, and that has never been redressed. So when you talk to indigenous nations or folks from indigenous nations, that is a crime that, that goes on, right? They all owe past due rent at the very least, okay? okay. Unless unless we're saying that the people who were here, um, they didn't matter and what happened is fine. And as far as our relationship with current day white folks, I think the best thing to do is when you see black space that is, that is buttressed, to let that be black space, you know? Uh, there, there is no need to infringe or encroach or come into. If you're trying to ally yourself as a co-conspirator, there are a lot of ways to do that. I, I would point out the white people for Black Lives. They're doing a lot of good work around that. Um, I think that there are some intergroup dialogue groups that 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 work on white people dealing with their own sort of, I guess, the fragility and mm-hmm. ways that they've been uh, brought into this. James Baldwin would say that being white is actually a, a lie. Right. Mm -hmm. Meaning that that you come from a people, you come from a place and to become white is to kind of undo all of that truth from who you come from. Um, Some of the more radical scholars say everyone's indigenous to somewhere and some practice. Mm -hmm. Get back in touch with that. And that might be a way forward to joining um, in undoing the ways that other people are being harmed. Um, You can read and work and, 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 and continue that lifelong unlearning of the ways, just like anti-blackness has been socialized into us, pro-whiteness, which is also anti-blackness, has been socialized into white folks. So there's an unlearning that has to take place at the at the mind and heart level um, to, to, that goes forward. So that would be my my very general advice. Um, Good advice. Uh, let me let me. I'll jump in and just say um, as well. I think um, for those who want to uh, ally themselves. Um, you're probably, especially if you're in like the, the education world, healthcare world, you're going to come across all kinds of people. And I think um, that unlearning should translate into an act into action. And that action should be that you should be looking for ways that the system you're in is actually working against um, 
uh, young people, you know, or, or, or in, in the case of education or, or, or patients in general in, in, the, in the healthcare field. So there's a lot that can be done. And I, it's interesting when I look back on my own life, um, there were, there was more than one. I, I grew up predominantly in white schools my whole life, but there were a few teachers through the process that actually were very helpful in making sure that I was okay. And it's interesting when I look back on it, I can remember, um, um, uh, Mr. Johnston at Bloomfield Junior High School teaching about the, um, the, the um, political spectrum uh, way back then and speaking to the fact that things weren't right in this country. Um, and that was powerful to hear outside of church and outside of the Black community, uh, some of what you were just saying, actually, um, about the injustices that have happened in this country. So I think if you're if you if there's an honesty that is that is given, um, and I think there's a, a, a bit of a look to make sure that when you come across, it's, let's say if you're a teacher, you come across a Black child in school, make sure they are in a safe space. Make sure they don't have to walk in and go from green to yellow just because they walked into the classroom. Hmm. Um, and I, this uh, reminds me of some books that would be helpful for some to read by uh, Jawanza Kanjufu, um, Countering the Conspiracy to Destroy Black Boys. Um, I ran into him at the Soul Vegetarian Restaurant in Atlanta, um, run by the Hebrew Israelites, and it was a phenomenal experience just standing in line talking to him because I'd read all of his books. Um, and um, he's a Black nationalist Christian. He, he was profound in this. Um, and he speaks to the fact that something that um, uh, Dr. Watson has mentioned earlier, the systems were built to work against um, African Americans, and in his books, specifically boys. So I would challenge anyone who wants to help to really look at that and say, how do we create a safer space, a better space, a stronger space um, for those individuals when they are outside of their normal uh, element, as it were? Good yeah. advice. I'll I'll chime in just one simple word, which is just listen or two listen and empathize. Um, I think is our key components that are there without judgment, without putting your own thoughts into it. There's a great uh, speaker, I'm bl blanking on his name. He, he adopted a young black child and he was African American, he was uh, Caucasian. And he told the story really basically kind of fast forwarding several stories really about his journey raising two young black kids with he and his Caucasian wife. And one of the things he brought up was just how he loved the book To Kill a Mockingbird and how his son hated the book To Kill a Mockingbird. And he was like, what do you mean? You should love this book. And, and so he finally stopped and he listened. And what he realized is the fact that in this book, it's a Caucasian man saving a, a black man. And so his son related to the black man and did not like the perception and things. And then when he stopped and listened, he understood. And he said, that's one of the key things that he's learned in his journey as a father, truly of love, is just to listen without judgment and try to listen uh, empathetically. Great. Thank you, guys. Those are pretty much the comments and questions. I'll let you guys get ready to close out. Thank you. All right. It's, thanks. All right. All right. So, we'll, you know, we like to leave these conversations with essentially your last word some hope as well that we can kind of give give to the folks who are out there and we kind of go around robin and we start with you dr watson since you're the guest on the show yeah i just well i want to thank the um thank you all for organizing this and the work that you both do to to support our health um i'm learning uh, even from the work that you're all doing about things that i can do better for, for myself and my family and i want to thank the the her lab at sf state and the the young men who were in the study sharing for, for sharing their stories, letting their cells share their stories. A lot of history of racism for black people being asked to give their cells. So that trust is like major for me. Um, and I think that my last, if, if there's a last word, it's that, you know, there are ways that we can be focusing on black wellness and black health. And that requires a centering of our community, of our ties to each other, our love for and with one another. Um, and oftentimes that will be somewhat antagonistic or against the, the everyday normative things that we have to do in a society that's really built on anti-blackness. And, and I would say that we have to try to support folks who are doing that work um, and support the folks amongst us who are, who are not supported even by us a lot of times, like black trans women um, and others who we know in our community are, are rendered as even less human than we might be. Um, and, and, Beyond that, I think that the, the true message that I'm hearing from 
from, from my colleagues' work is around love and trying to really make that, what is it Dr. Cornell West talks about, right? That social justice is what love looks like in public. And I would say that <laughs> black people caring for each other is what love, love looks like for us across time. And so I wanna like push that idea of like us remembering how to do that even better uh, going forward. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, you couldn't have said it better. Uh, Eric? I think what I, what, uh, I wanna reiterate some of what we discussed earlier um, and just say that when you're dealing with stress, it really is about how stress is managed. Stress equals demands minus resources. Um, and we, start, we spoke a lot about the demands, a lot of the microaggression and um, even gave some of our own personal experiences around how we've been framed by the society that we're in. But there's a lot of resources as well. Um, and we talked a lot about um, uh, love. I like the, that what you said there. Love is actually protective, um, which is powerful in and of itself. Um, but so are communities. Um, uh, and I love what you said. I am because we are. And you know, I want to. I want to really encourage people. I know a lot of the people that are listening in um, probably are people who attend church services every weekend. Um, I think one of the things that I would encourage is that finding ways for your faith community to reach into the broader community and show that love. Um, finding ways to support families. Um, I love what was said about basics, and you know, in, in the talks I've been given recently, I've been talking a lot about um, faith communities, community gardens after school tutoring programs, um, you know, family uh, supportive programs, or parenting and other things, finding ways to reach back into the community and offer uh, things that they're, you're just not gonna get happenstance in this society. So um, I really wanna encourage people to, to move, especially those in faith communities, move their faith communities from, from, from contemplation to action um, when it comes to a lot of these things. Yes. I'm gonna chime in just to say lastly, is that I'm, I'm left hopeful after this conversation. A lot of times you can get lost in this conversation, looking at microaggressions, looking at aggressions, looking at discrimination, things that you seem as, seem as if you don't have a sense of control. Hearing that our lives are shorter at a very young age compared to folks who are 20, 30 years older than us. But I'm left with a profound sense of hope, of knowing that when we embrace resiliency through love, that when we embrace resiliency through community, through community, that we can actually embolden our health, that we can transform our health to counteract the stresses that are there. And so the, the reality of it is, is that the power is ours to, to enact this change. The power is ours to form a community of wherever, and you pride out beautifully. It's not just the congregation of people who look just like you, it's people who are look like you and who don't, who are moving in a state of love. They're delivering love. That's really what it's about out there. So I'm encouraged. And I think that there's hope for us. There's hope amidst the crises of 2020, of COVID, of social unrest, of looking at all of these deleterious things that are attacking our health, that we can still survive, not only through our community, not only through love and through our food. And we go into that even more. And so we know coming up, we're having, and so it's been a blessing having you on. It's been a blessing reaching out to you. I'm extremely thankful for those who put us in touch with you. Um, you're a humble, you're a humble giant in my mind. And so I, I, I truly appreciate you kind of spending time with us this, this evening, really, to kind of go over a lot of the information here. Oh, thank, yeah. you all. thank you both. Yeah, blessings on you, on your family, on mm -hmm. your work. Um, you are incredibly, you represent Mo Valley very well. Oh. Very intelligent young man. And um that's a, that's a, that's a, yeah, man. Okay. <laughs> you have a beautiful, humble spirit, man. And I and I just like I said, I pray God's richest blessings on you. So okay. um we have to do this again at some point. Um hopefully yes. in front of cameras for the documentary. Um mm -hmm and really give you a chance to shine the light of what you've learned around, especially around the work of telomeres, uh, would I think would really be altering for a lot of people in America to see that kind of um, work and outcome. Oh, Absolutely. Thank you both, blessings to you both. Um, thank you so much for having me on. Um, All right. Thank you for what y'all doing. All righty. Wonderful. So next week, folks, tune back in, same place, same time, 7 p.m. Next week, we're gonna be touching on weaponization of nutrition. Weaponization of nutrition is the next phase inside the Slave Food Project. And so we encourage you to be there, witness it, 
learn from it and make changes. Don't just, knowing it's not enough, you have to apply, willing it's not enough, you have to do. So we look forward to you. Thank you once again to Dr. Watson and on behalf of Dr. Walsh, wish you guys a great weekend. Thanks so much.